Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. So today, I want to tell you about a short story that is going on in my laboratory related to brain science with the title, Brain on a Chip. How do we start? Let's start with a simple thing. Let's start with the brain. We all know brain is important. Brain is the organ that defines us as an individual. Another thing that we know is that brain is complex. Brain is composed of 100 billion of neurons, each of which making connections, thousands of connections with each other. 100 billion neurons making 100 trillion connections. That is complex. Now, understanding the brain function is without doubt one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century science. And many people are working very hard at it. And also, many people believe the starting point might be to build the map of the brain, like this. Well, this is a map of soul, but let's say that this is a map of the brain. What do I mean by a map of the brain? What I mean by that is to know the location of each and every cell of in the brain, knowing what kind it is, because there are lots of different kinds of brain cells in the brain, and then knowing each and every connections between them. That is a daunting task that requires a lot of technological advances, but we are making a lot of progresses. For example, if you're talking about brain of a small animal, like a fruit fly, we now have a complete map. We know the location of each and every neuron inside that brain. We know what type they are. We know what kind of connections that they are making. Even for the bigger brain, like human brain, we have rough yet extremely useful map. For example, we know what different regions are doing and what kind of connections that they are making. So, we are making progress toward building a map of the brain. Does that mean that we understand the brain function? The answer is simple, no. Right? So, think about this particular map. And let's say that somebody give you this map and then ask you, okay, I have now given you a map. Would you please tell me what was going on in that city? Then you'll be like, what the heck? <laughs> and then actually move on. So, map itself is not enough. You actually have to add the context. You have to add people. You have to add cards. You have to do a lot of different things in order to use that map to understand the function. How'd you do it? Well, one clue comes from the fact that neurons communicate with each other through electrochemical means. Their signal is electrical. And there are many, many, many neurons. Many, many electrical. Do those words remind you of something? It might, because it's similar to computer chips. Computer chips use electrical signals, and there are lots of elements. Billions and trillions, if you think about it. Those are the words that you actually have used quite often when you describe computer chips. Gigabits per second, terabytes. Those are words that we use quite often. So, in addition to that, computer chips, you know, that are properly designed, can be used to sense electrochemical signals as well. So you might think that, okay, computer chips, which has many, many elements, and which can detect electrochemical signals. If you put the brains on top, then we're done, right? The answer is, of course, not again. Why? Because brain is living. Computer, cell, computer chip is not, it's dead. Brain is soft, computer chip is hard. Brain is three-dimensional, computer chip is not. So making an efficient interface between a computer chip and brain is a difficult task. A lot of people are making beautiful progress toward it, 
but it is still a very challenging task. So most of the tools that are available now, based upon computer chips, turns out to be low fidelity. What do I mean by that? Let's say you come to visit Boston, where I live, and you hear that Boston Red Sox is red hot. They are a baseball team, and they are really good at the moment. And so you decide to go to the Fenway Park and then get in there and see how they are playing. And you find out that, oh, hold on a second, the tickets are all sold out. What do you do? You sit outside the Fenway Park, listen to the crowds, and then whenever there is a roar, then that means that, oh, something interesting is happening. That's one way to watch the baseball game, and that's actually what computer chips, so-called microelectrode arrays, are doing when you, are talking about, when you are trying to connect with the brain. But of course, if you want to learn deeply about what brain cells are doing, you want to get into the park and then watch it yourself, right? And that's what we are trying to do. We have been working on that for the past seven or eight years. How do we do it? By leveraging nanotechnology. Basically, what we are doing is to connect the brain and a computer chip through the nanoscale electrodes so that we can build an efficient interface between them. In a sense, what we are building can be considered as a special type of camera chip. This is image of the chips that we are generating with neurons on top. What do I mean by camera chip? You guys all have a camera chip in your cell phone, right? They have many, many different pixels, and each pixel records light signal. And as a consequence, using that camera chip, you can take a picture or a movie. Our chip do not detect light signal. It still has a lot of pixels, but each pixel responds to the neuronal chatter instead of detecting light signal. When neurons shout, those pixels generate a big signal. When neurons whisper, they generate smaller signal. So using our computer chip with nanoscale electrodes that can interface with neurons, you can actually record new movies about how the neurons are talking to each other, like this. So this particular movie that I will show is a movie generated by placing brain cells from a schizophrenia patient. What we did was to actually get the skin cells from the schizophrenia patient, convert them into the induced pluripotent stem cells, and then derive them into the neurons and then put them onto our computer chip and record their activities using our computer chip. Whenever you see those white dots, that means that neurons on top of that pixel is talking. If it's bright white, that means it's shouting. But if it's dim light white, that means it's whispering. And by recording these types of movies for a long time, and by analyzing in detail, you can actually build detailed pictures about the connections between the neurons as well as their function. And that's what we are now trying to do. So that sounds all good, except the fact that it's not clear exactly how we're going to use it at the moment. So we have a new tool. Tool is a tool is a tool until you use it and to do useful things, right? So what do we do with it? That's the question. So one of the first things that we are now trying to do with those types of computer chips that can talk to the brain cells is to use them as a drug screening tool. So it turns out that there are lots of different brain disease, neurological disorders. They have one thing in common. There is no effective cure for any of them. One of the reasons why is quite clear. We don't know how the brain works that well at the moment. As a consequence, developing a cure is difficult. Another, somewhat more minor, but still important reason is because there is no effective way of screening drug candidates for particular types of neurological disorder. So shown here is one of the machines that people are now using in order to screen variety different kinds of drugs. Basically, what they do is to put isolated neuron-like cells into this machine, 
give them lots of different drugs, see how those neuron-like cells are responding, and then find the promising candidate and move on to the second stage. But there are some things that is lacking. First, they test with isolated cells. And they do not even work with the brain cells, but brain cell-like cells. Some cells that are not brain cells, but behave similarly. So there are lots of deficiencies in these types of testing. And we believe that computer chips that we are generating can help improve those types of situations. After all, we can talk to thousands of neurons at the same time, and those neurons can be patient-derived, meaning that we can actually get them from patients. And we can actually test different types of drugs on them and see which actually works better. So together with Mass General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and the Broad Institute, we are working very hard to test a variety of different drugs for different types of neurological disorder. So that's one thing that we do. What other things would we do? Well, the other thing that we do, the second thing that we try to do is to inform on neural network and neuromorphic chips. Now, neural network and neuromorphic chips, you might have heard about them because they are the workhorse of so-called artificial intelligence, which is transforming our lives at the moment as we speak. So, neural network and neuromorphic computing chips as their name suggests, are inspired by biological brain. The problem is that over the past 30 years, because brain science was sort of stagnating, these areas in computational science actually developed independently. So by now, computational neural network and biological neural network, although they share different types of syntaxes or language, they are quite distinct. I believe that the computer chips that we are generating might be able to help to remedy that situation by bridging the gap. So what we are trying to do is the following. Use our computer chips to learn about the architectures of the connections in a biological tissue, say, retina. Use that information to build a better neuromorphic chips and then see whether we can actually improve their function. For example, vision processor. Would it work? remains to be seen, but at least we are trying quite hard. The third area that we are excited about is brain-machine interface. And this area, the work in this area, at least in my group, was inspired by this particular video recorded by John Donahue's group at the Brown University. He's a good friend of mine. He is a word expert in brain-machine interfaces. So in this video, you will see this particular patient with a quadriple quadriplegia, she cannot move her hand or leg, neck down. So she volunteered to do the experiment. So John actually implanted this brain machine interfaces to her head. And she actually, you know, and record what she's trying to think and then use that information and analyze them using a computers over there and then move the robotic arms over here. So you will see that in this particular movie that she is trying to move that bottle and then drink something from it. Now, this movie is remarkable in a lot of different sense, but the thing is that what moves me most is at the end. She can now move the robotic arms and can drink the content. I don't know what it was in there. But what's most amazing is how happy she is afterwards. Having said that, there are lots of different problems. Well, do you want to have this on your head? Which is connected by wire to the computer. And although it's not seen, in her head, in her brain, there is this surgically implanted. Not necessarily a good thing. So what we are trying to do is to improve upon the situation by making smaller, better, and hopefully wireless interface. Can be done or not, remains to be seen, but at least I believe it's worthwhile trying. Of course, we are not the only people who are trying to work in that area. There are lots of different people who are making beautiful progress in that area. There are lots of companies who are trying to leverage those advances and then make advances. Now, 
That's a great thing because it can change people's lives. But at the same time, it's a dangerous thing as well because it can be problematic. What happens if somebody hacks into the computer chips in your brain or if the brain chip actually malfunctions? You do something, whose fault is it? How do we deal with it? I don't know. But the thing is that whenever, just like any other cases, whenever there is a breakthrough technological advances, there are implications, societal implications that comes with it. Not only we actually have to work on the advances in technology, but we actually have to be ready for their societal, societal impact. And there are lots of different examples of that. This is one simple example of that. So let me end by giving a proper credit to the people who deserve all the credit. So these are the people who actually worked in, the, in my lab to make that happen. Jeffrey Abbott and Tian Yang Ye, those are, those are two people who actually made those computer chips possible. And last and not the least is my close friend and dear collaborator, Tony Hem, who is an electrical engineering professor at Harvard University. Without him, all those computer chips would not have been possible. And thank you very much for your attention.